May these words be spoken and heard in the power of love. Amen. Thank you. What a feast of scripture we've been served by the lectionary this week. Living water. It may just be drinks, but living water is still a powerful theme for us to reflect upon in this third week of Lent. John says that Jesus was on his way north towards the Galilee after a stint at the southern end of the Jordan River system where John, John the Baptist, had been drawing crowds for his religious renewal project. And as he makes that journey, which is in the verses just before we started the gospel reading, he's tired and he stops by the well outside the village of Sychar. Jesus, of course, had been among the crowds gathered around John, drawn to John. It was an important part of his own spiritual journey to be there. Again, that detail is not in the portion of John we've just read, but that information puts the episode by the well in context. For at the heart of the religious renewal project led by John was a call for people to do more than just attend the major festivals at the temple in Jerusalem, but to go deeper and, and, to, um, and to indicate that by undergoing a ritual of baptism, which was not something Jewish people ever did. John was an innovator. If you were converting to Judaism, you were baptized. But if you were born into a Jewish family, if you were a boy, you were circumcised, but I guess you got over it, and a girl, you just went on with your life. Baptism was a sign and sense that John's listeners were willing to start all over again, as if they had just converted into Judaism for the very first time. And baptism in living water, by which the ancient people meant running water. Okay, so hence the baptisms of John are down by the Jordan River. So the water is alive and flowing, unlike the wells of water at the temple in Jerusalem. So doubtless living water was on the mind of Jesus as he rested by the well and probably wished he had a bucket. But of course it was not just any well. This was the well that people then and now believed had first been dug by Jacob. Jacob, of course, being the father of the famous 12 sons of Israel, who had himself purchased land at this location and settled there, according to some verses in Genesis 33. All the exact verses will be on the website if you want them. Again, as an aside, following up from a comment last week, Notice that in that story in Genesis 33, Jacob pays for the land which he's taking. He acknowledges the indigenous owners and he negotiates a purchase of that parcel of land where the well was subsequently dug. So the concept of conquest and ethnic cleansing is not grounded in Genesis. It comes, of course, out of the book of Joshua. And Israel was the name given to Jacob after he spent an anxious night wrestling with some divine visitor in his dreams or in real life, who knows, prior to his long anticipated reconciliation with Esau, his twin brother, who he had defrauded out of the birthright and the inheritance. Jacob lived up to his old name, um, the usurper, the deceiver. And he's given a new name that night Israel. So there's a powerful backstory to this well and to the encounter that Jesus is going to have with the local woman. In fact, throughout the Bible, wells feature as sites for important encounters. And often these are encounters that have a critical role in the unfolding story of salvation. When Hagar and her son Ishmael are thrown out of the camp, by Abraham because his other wife is jealous of the second wife, God reveals a well to Hagar which she had not previously seen, Genesis 16. Abraham himself is said to have dug a well at Beersheba, which we think of in terms of the 
um, sort of military battles of the First World War, but Beersheba means seven wells. It was, a, it was a lovely, fertile oasis in the desert. Abraham's trusted servant is sent back home to northern Syria to look for a suitable wife for Isaac, Abraham's son, and where does he go? He goes straight to the well because he's hoping that somebody will turn up at the well who will know the family of Abraham and, and of course Rachel herself turns up and the music plays in the background and we know it's going to be a lovely romantic encounter. Isaac goes on to dig his own well at Beersheba. No wonder there are seven wells there. It's like every, every patriarch digs a well at Beersheba. Jacob will meet his wife, uh, sorry, Rachel, I've got Rebecca here, but it's Rachel, at another well in Genesis 29. And Moses famously meets his future wife at a well in the Sinai Desert in Exodus chapter two. And in early Christian tradition, although not in the Gospel of Luke itself, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary at the well in Nazareth. And as the Christians told that story and sort of picked up Luke and elaborated it, they imagined that this must have happened at the well, because that's where these kind of things happen. So if you see icons of the Annunciation, it's often at the well. And indeed, every spring that runs all year in Palestine is called Mary's Well, okay. whether the village is Muslim or Christian. So here in John chapter four, Jesus rests by a well and the informed audience of this story from the ancient world goes, aha, uh -huh. hero stops by well, woman will soon appear, important conversation will happen. It's a scene, it's a motif. It's like the chase scene in a movie. As soon as it starts, we go, aha, uh -huh. we know what's happening here. And as we still see in many developing countries, including the ones we will be supporting through the ABM Lent Appeal, collecting water from the community well is women's work. It's too hard for guys to do it. And of course, they usually do it early in the morning when it's cool or late in the afternoon when it's no longer so hot. The well, like the Furphy & Co water cart in World War I, was not just the place to get water. When the soldiers went to the Furphy to fill up their water canteens, they came back with news about the war and the battle and what the plans were for tomorrow. Hence, we have the expression, that's just a Furphy. It's not serious information. You picked it up and we'd say today, you picked it up at the water cooler in the office because that's where all the gossip gets shared. These days it's probably on Facebook. So here we are at the well. Jesus is resting there around the middle of the day. He sent the disciples into town to get food, to look for something to eat, which is kind of strange for a guy who could have just snapped his fingers and there was a four course meal. But anyway, the disciples have gone into town to look for something to eat. It was just a regular day, not a miraculous day. And a woman comes out to the well to draw water at midday. So there's something strange going on here. As the story unfolds, we hear that she's been married several times, five different husbands, and that the man she's living with at the moment is not actually a man she's married to. That sounds like an Anglican person, doesn't it, really? Um, but that may not be the reason she's coming out in the middle of the day. She may just have had a bad morning, the kids wouldn't get up to go to school, you know, the microwave wasn't working properly, and she's running late. So she gets out to the well about the middle of the day. The point is, it's an unusual time, and that adds to the idea, this is going to be a special meeting. This is the craft of the storyteller. So she arrives and Jesus does what men often do. And I hope you heard it in my intonation when I read the gospel. He asks her for a drink. Hey love, could you get me a drink? Could you get me a coldie, please? Maybe not even please. That's a very archetypal man, woman conversation, isn't it? it? Never goes the other way. Could I get you a drink? No, it's always, 
hey, could you bring me a drink? Could I have a drink? So again, it's starting out the way these conversations do. And the woman is happy to do that, but she notes that he seems to be Jewish because of the clothes he's wearing, because of the accent from Galilee, and that people like him wouldn't even touch a cup that she has handled, or indeed any other Samaritan has handled. She's not inclined to cross cultural boundaries. But Jesus is a repeat offender. He crosses boundaries all the time. Here he is talking with a woman who's not a relative, who's a Samaritan to boot, and he's asking her to serve him a drink, to provide him some hospitality. It's kind of the reverse of the Good Samaritan story, isn't it, out of Luke? The story's a long one. It actually goes through to verse 45. So aren't you glad I didn't read the whole thing this morning? And there's a long, typical Johannine kind of conversation between the woman and Jesus that gets down to the ancient conflict between Samaritans and Jews and which place does God want people to worship at and so on. But here, what we read out today is just the opening scene where Jesus opens up a conversation with the woman about living water. And in the couple of sentences directly after verse 12 where we stopped, we have this exchange. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. A few chapters later in chapter 7, we find Jesus standing up at the temple at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles uh, at Sukkot and, and um, making a statement that um, echoes his, his conversation with the woman at the well. Here's the bit from John 7. On the last day of the festival, the great climactic day, while Jesus was standing there in the temple, he cried out, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and let the one who believes in me drink. As scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. And then John adds, now he said this about the spirit which believers in him were to receive. So like the woman who finds herself chatting with a strange Jewish man at the well, we say to Jesus, Lord, sir, can we have that water you speak of? Can we have that living water? And as we gather here at the table of Jesus today, that's our prayer, isn't it? Open a spiritual well, dig a spiritual well deep within us. Let us drink the water of eternal life. And eternal life doesn't mean life that goes on forever, but the life of eternity, sharing the very life of God. Quench our innermost thirst. May your spirit surge within us and become a stream of living water for others. Amen.